Welcome to Master Gardening. I'm your host, Bud Kwok, and as usual, we have a great show for you today. We're at my house, and we got a lot of things to talk about, so let's get started. I'll be right back. These are some of my favorites. Uh, me and my spouse, Winna, did these. She did most of the work. Last year we bought a really expensive baskets and put them up. I painted it all, all the chains and everything, got everything back to, to, to uh, square one. And we bought these plants for about 35 or 40 dollars each. Uh, didn't realize that <laughs> if you do it yourself, it's almost going to cost you the same thing. But last year we had some asparagus fern and some sweet potato vine and things, and they were beautiful. But the roots took the whole pot up, so by the end of the summer, we were having to water these things twice a day. Uh, you're going to have to water them once a day anyway. We put water crystals in there, and if you know what water crystals are, they're little like pasta things that absorb the moisture and they cut down on your watering. And we did use some really first class uh, potting mix, but still you got to water them once a day. But you get, if you do it yourself, and we use the same, same uh, coconut straw, and same wire, uh, but if you do it yourself, you can put the plants in that you want and you like instead of having to pick one from a nursery or Lowe's or Walmart or wherever you get your plants, you can put the plants you want in there. And we like these the best and they don't take over and we only have to water once a, once a week. Uh, less watering, believe it or not, without those other plants that take up the whole, whole uh, mix. Okay, uh, and before we, we go to the back day and, out and look at some, some uh, day lilies, Sometimes you have a plant that's mostly there for the foliage. Very insignificant blooms, but if you watch them real closely, they'll go to seed. And once the plant goes to seed, it thinks its job is done. It starts shutting down. So as long as you just keep pinching that little bloom off, and I know most of you all know that, but I'm saying this for maybe somebody that doesn't grow coleus, so you keep pinching those blooms off, that plant will keep producing and, and looking better all the way up until frost. Okay, let's go back. I want to show you what to do with some daylilies when they start getting spent. Uh, they start looking really ugly, but there's a couple tricks to make them look nice, especially if they're in your front yard. We're here at my side yard, but just so happens my side yard is on the main road, so everybody sees this. Now, if this was in the backyard, I wouldn't be so particular. But maybe you want to make it look a little bit better. It's pretty nasty looking, I think. The, the blooms are all spent. I think this is the last of the Mohegans right here. But every, all the other blooms are spent. But one of the first things you want to do, and you might want to do this as it goes along, you want to cut these things off here. And you can go ahead and do that anytime you want to. It won't hurt the plant. You go all the way down, at least underneath the leaves, and cut that off. If you wait long enough, like some of these are, and this is the way most gardeners like to do it, especially if it's in the backyard, you just wait till it turns brown, and then you can just, <laughs> you pull it out like that. If it's dead enough, you can just pull them out. And that way it's really quick, instead of making a thousand cuts with your, with your pruner or whatever. Okay, then the leaves start turning yellow, and they've already started turning yellow. I've waited this long on purpose. And these are day lilies. These aren't the best ones in the world. <laughs> they get, some of them call them ditch lilies. But the leaves start turning yellow and it look like heck. You just go ahead and go all the way down and cut them off. About three or four inches off the ground. First of all, you've eliminated all those ugly leaves. And guess what happens? It sprouts all new leaves and they come up and they're really beautiful, green and luscious again. And they look good all the way to fall. They probably aren't going to bloom again, but I have seen that happen. But I don't, I don't, I'm not going to promise you they're going to bloom again, but they'll look really good again. Just doesn't take very long to do that. Okay, while we're here, these are calla lilies. And they've all had, they've had just loaded with big, beautiful blooms. And they're really popular for weddings and all kinds of things, cut flowers. And they're very expensive. The bulbs are even expensive. But if you want to propagate them, I don't know if you can see these or not, but they're, down here on the bottom, there's these, these blooms, these spent blooms, they start forming a, a seed pod, and as they get heavy, they bend over all the way to the ground to touching the ground. In certain places, if they have a chance, all those seeds are going to sprout, and you're going to have another two dozen calla lilies. But many times, you don't want them where they're at, so leave, let them dry, 
And once they get dry, cut them off, put them in a greenhouse, and then in the spring, go ahead and just use them like tomato seeds or whatever, and, and, and plant them in a, in a pot of potting mix, and you'll have a whole another bunch to give, either plant yourself or give to your neighbors and friends. But the, the foliage on these things, I recommend them highly. You can see how beautiful they are, even after the, the, the bloom is spent and it's going to seed. It doesn't care, the leaves don't turn yellow, at least in, <laughs> if you keep them watered, which we're getting, in, getting into a drought right now, but you can see how beautiful they are. I recommend the calla lilies very highly. And get some bulbs off your friends because I think these babies sometimes are three or four or five dollars a bulb, especially the colored ones. You get them in yellow and red. Most of mine are white. Okay, let's, I wanna show you about some pesticides and some, uh, fungicides and some other things that you may be interested in. A lot of people say no, strictly organic, but <laughs> I have Bermuda grass. I have Bermuda grass and I have nut sedge and you can't get by organically with those two things in your, in your, in your beds. But I'll, I'll show you what, what I use sometimes and you have to make that decision for yourself. Let's go around back by the greenhouse. <music> There are a number of enemies for gardeners, uh, and you all know them very well. There are weeds, and a weed, definition of a weed is a plant that it is in a place where you don't want it to be. It could be a rose in a place where you didn't want a rose, and a rose would be a weed. But anyhow, weeds, there are funguses around this, this area of the country. The funguses are really bad uh, on your tomato plants, your peppers, your roses, your grapes, uh, and then there are bugs, pests. Okay, and they're, they're good pests, they're good diseases, well I don't know about that, and there are good weeds, but today I'm going to show you what I use because I have Bermuda and nut sedge in my, in my uh, yard. I like the Bermuda, but it has to be kept under control and there has to be a way to do that, and just using a regular weed killer or pulling it up is not going to work. It's got rhizomes that go underneath and, you, and you're, you, you can make it look good, but you're not getting rid of it. Okay, let's start with uh, pests bugs, uh, Japanese beetles. I saw the first ones, they didn't have any last year, the first ones this year are my roses, and you spray them and you kill them, but then the rose buds open back up and that, that rose bud has not got any uh, insecticide on it, so the, they, come, they come again, so you gotta keep spraying. Uh, you, pick, you can pick them off, but they're, when you got a million of them on your roses or on a tree, you're not gonna hand pick them off, and they can completely destroy a tree, take every leaf off of a plum tree. So I use these because I, I'm kind of lazy. These hook up to your garden hose and you can spray them with a the garden hose and get a big area covered really quickly. Seven is one of your more milder pesticides. It takes care of most of your, your uh, doesn't take care, care of bagworms. I mean, I'm tent caterpillars, I'm sorry, but uh, you gotta go up higher, higher strength. But seven takes care of almost everything on your, on your vegetables. And once you spray seven on there, within a few days to a week, you're, you can eat the vegetables supposedly without any harm. Uh, this works on my roses also for just most bugs. When you see your, your, your leaves being eating, eaten, last year my roses didn't have a single pest. So I got lazy. This year they were beautiful. The next day, they were almost gone. The blooms were ruined, the leaves were all gone, and the, the fungicides hit them also. This is a two-in-one in insect and fungicide. It's made by Bayer, and whatever you do, Bayer has what, call, what are called nicotinoids, or neonics, that use nicotine on the bugs. They are almost 100% directly responsible for the colony collapse disorder for bees. Uh, I'll probably get sued over that, but, <laughs> am I allowed to say that? <laughs> uh, most, most beekeepers, and I'm a beekeeper, I've got a, got a hive back here, stay away from the nicotinoids. I think I'm pronouncing that right, neonics. This gets the diseases and the funguses at the same time. Your leaves turn brown and black and then fall off of your tomato plants, on your peppers, and my peppers are hit, getting hit right now. That's a fungus. Okay, let's, uh, or you can just get one for, for fungicides. Uh, I've got one here for sp just spray and it's not, it's for small spots. Okay, um, let's go to weeds next. Weeds are my favorite. No. <laughs> Nut sedge. 
You think Bermuda is invasive and hard to get rid of? Nut sedge is a lot worse. We didn't have any nut sedge 10 years ago. I don't know where it came from, but my yards eat up with it and it gets into my beds. If you pull nut sedge up, it's got a bunch of little nodules down in the ground. If you pull it up, you think you got rid of it, you don't. Those five little nodules come up, so instead of having one, you got five. It's the same way with Roundup. You put Roundup on it, it kills the plant, then if the, the nodules come up, you get five more. The only way I've found so far is to dig it up and throw the soil away with the roots and the, nut, and the nuts and, put it, and throw it in the trash. I guess it goes to the landfill. I'm trying to figure out how to not do that because that's <laughs> I've got a lot of it and I don't want to throw all that stuff away. This is ortho nut sedge killer. I'm trying that. Uh, I've got a, a, a friend in uh, uh, Phyllis and Jim Petkoff. They have a, a, something they're going to give me uh, Monday that they use. They say it works, but uh, and we'll, we'll we'll show you a picture of that nuts what nut sedge looks like. A lot of people don't even know what it looks like. Grass. It looks like wonderful grass, but nut sedge. Uh, I mentioned Roundup a while ago on my Bermuda. Roundup does a really good job on your Bermuda. Uh, it may take two or three times to hit it. You got to be real careful on a windy day and you may not know how windy it is. Uh, a little bit of wind will spray that and take it right on over to your, to your other plants and kill it. I've, I've killed at least one plant with this by accident because it was, there was a little bit of wind. I like to put a shield up between my plant I want to save and, and the, and the uh, and Roundup, they have a, a, a wand now they sell that goes right on top of the plant. It, it does what I'm saying, but I've, I've not tried that, but I'm a little suspect of wands because they, I, I've had trouble with them in the past. I like this kind of sprayer right here the best. This just kills the plant. And not, Roundup's not the only one that has, the, uh, has stuff out there that'll do the same thing. I'm just, this is just the one I use. This is it's called extended control. It kills the plant, but it also has what's called treflan in it. Treflan is a pre-emergence herbicide that kills seeds. So it also kills the plant, but it also kills any seeds that are, that are there that might sprout next. So if, you, if you're spraying the plant and you don't want it to come back like in the driveway or sidewalk, you, want it, you don't want to spray every week for the plants, you use this and it, that should take care of it for the whole year, the whole year. Okay, let's, let's talk about fertilizer. Oh no, that's, that's, that's next week. <laughs> okay, preen, we're talking about weeds again. Preen is the same thing as treflan. You buy, if you go to a farm store and a farmer's buying treflan for his, for his uh, corn patch or, or beans, it's treflan. Preen is treflan. It's a pre-emergence herbicide that's also in the Roundup I just talked about. When you get done weeding or you get done cultivating or tilling and, you, and you, you're, you're done, you take this preen and you sprinkle these little, little nodules all over that area. And then if you got time and you, and you want to do it, you can just kind of rake it in just very slightly into the surface, just so gently in the surface of that, that soil. It take, the seeds won't germinate. It's not 100% proof, but it'll knock out about 80-90% of your weeds. While we're here, and I hope I have questions on this. Send your questions in to the WKCTC. This time of year in Kentucky, and that's where we're at, Kentucky, I guess I'm allowed to say that, uh, we have a drought. So July, August, and September is a good chance you're going to go a while without a drought. All this stuff that in my yard, or mo almost all of it, is less than a year old. I, I know it's, yeah, even these tall <laughs> sunflowers, we're going to talk about those in a minute. So if you've got a plant that's less than a year old, it doesn't have the root system. So it's, you're going to have to water it. Even, even for years, you may have to water it. But especially trees, shrubs, bigger, bigger plants need watering. But your other annuals and perennials that you planted need watering. There's all kind of stuff out there. There's got this one right here that you can pull along on the wheels and come outside and jerk the jerk the hose and it'll move a, a little bit and keep sprinkling it. Uh, very gentle, it's very gentle and that's m mostly for yards. You're not going to get the, your, your flower beds with this very, very good. Garden golf courses made these famous. They have big, huge professional looking ones, but these are the impact sprayers. It goes You like that? 
big areas. That's good for big areas and mostly yards, but it gets a circle and it doesn't get a square. And it's hard, you get, your corners of your yard aren't going to get anything. Here's one I picked up, and this sprays an area really hard and heavy and quickly. It can water an area, say, uh, eight feet by eight feet. Just so you need, you've got a square that you need watered. This, this, this works. Then the uh, little gizmo right here, it's similar to that, but it's got all kind of patterns. It's got a circle on here, but most of them are square or rectangle. And you, depending on if, you're, if you've got a long, thin rectangle or a square box or a big area or a small area, you can dial this in. And whatever you dial in, that's what you're going to get. It's got a little pattern on there. You can see what you're going to do. Okay, this is good for, for square areas. Now, if you have plants growing up and you set this down underneath the plants, it's not going to work because it's going to hit those plants and it's going to kill the spray. All right. This is kind of a new one, I think. It's, I just saw this for the first time this year, and it's, it's a little more complicated, and it takes a little bit of practice, but once you get used to it, wherever you put it, you can, you can dial in whatever size you want and how big you want. It's got, supposedly got a, a water pump in here. I don't know how that works, but it talks about a water pump. If you hook, hook this up, the water goes 15 feet in the air, and then you can, you can take it and move it a little bit back and forth, or you can move it a lot or a little bit more back and forth or all the way back and forth and takes, a, I'd say, an area of maybe 40 feet by 40 feet or 50 feet by 50 feet if you want to. And then you've got another gizmo here that you can spread it out and make it wider or narrower. And, and these little arrows right here, uh, that's what I was saying, you can make it go all the way this way and not that way. And we'll get a good shot of this later. Okay, before we leave this area, I want to talk about this sunflower right here. I've got sunflowers all the way down the whole length of this bed, and it's, it's beautiful. And as the, as the one sunflower matures, then there's a sunflower that's going to be on every one of these limbs, in the, like a sucker in there. And I'd probably say probably this, this one right here will have 15, 20 blooms on it before it's all over. As it gets heavier, you can see it starts leaning, and you say, well, it's because it's heavier. That's not the only thing. <laughs> it's the birds. The, uh, the finches love this. This is a finch heaven. My, my, my whole garden is a finch heaven. They'll get on here, and by the way, there's two bees on there <laughs> right now, and they're, they're, their uh, pollen sacs are full on their legs. They love it, too. The bees love it, too, for pollen. But the, bee, the, the birds will get on here, and, and, it'll, and you get two or three birds on there, and you can imagine it starts tipping. And then they'll, they'll fly down to my Cosmos and my other plants, which that's, I'm not really proud of that, but they'll fly down and get on my Cosmos, which is these other tall plants here, and they can't support that bird. So guess what? They take it right to the ground. The bird takes it right to the ground. So I've got a lot of this stuff down here is leaning, and it's not leaning because of the sun or whatever. It's leaning because birds are trying to, <laughs> trying to land on it because they're wanting these flowers. Okay, let's go prune a boxwood. Okay, over by the yard. If you've got boxwoods or any other kind of shrub that you want to manicure or keep in the same shape, they get all kind of sprouts, and especially in the spring, they have this, you can see this right here, it's kind of, it's okay, but a lot of people like that not to be on there, like to be perfect balls or flat on top or square or whatever. And they, they hire people to do that and it's very expensive. It's not rocket science. This, this is pretty easy. You just need a couple tools. One is shears. And it, I use this mostly for after I've pruned it. If there's a couple sprouts come up later, instead of trying to do the whole thing or getting equipment all out, just cut, cut those few off the top and I can show you some pictures of some of my other shrubs that I've pruned and, and now they've got spikes coming up. It just takes about two seconds to trim those off. You can prune the whole thing with this, but that is almost rocket science. That's pretty tough with a pair of, a pair of these. If you get something, and this, this is really cheap. This, is, this doesn't cost much and I've had it for ever. Uh, hey, it works. <laughs> I've cut these cords twice now in my career. And uh, it's easy to do when you get around, you're doing all kind of stuff and you forget where the cord's at. But like I said, it's not rocket science. You, you, you almost, if you had it done before, you can almost see the pattern on there. 
and you can have it square on top if you want to, but I like it kind of round. Well, you get the, you get the picture. It's pretty easy, and maybe if you're not don't have to do a whole lot of them it can be kind of fun <laughs> you got to do a whole bunch in the heat of the day it can't be a lot of fun and in order to make it look like it's really harder than it is i've seen people lay sheets and, and towels and stuff all down around here and it takes you hours to lay the sheets and stuff down because you don't want those things getting in your mulch whatever you do well i i tried that and it's it's more work to put the towels down than it is to do the job and most of mine is either it ends up on the sidewalk or in the yard where you can mow over it with, a, with your lawnmower anyway. But if you take a rake, you can pretty well rake it all up and, and your mulch looks fine. So if, <laughs> you don't want to make somebody mad though, so you may want to try the sheets first, but don't make it harder than it is. Now let's go over to my raised beds, my tomatoes and my peppers. I want to show you a couple things over there that I'm kind of proud of. I'm here at my vegetable beds, my raised beds, and this is the second year for them. Last year was not much. This year you can see it's not too bad. Tomatoes and peppers mainly, but I had some onions along the side here. That's where the weeds are. That's the only place weeds are, where the onions and the broccoli was. Uh, and, and next year I'll have maybe two, maybe three more of these, at least two. Uh, and I think from, from four or five beds, I think I can grow everything I need to, need to grow in the summertime. These beds are two by, two by eights treated lumber, 16 feet long, four feet wide. And then I, when I after I made the beds and I sprayed Roundup on all, all my uh, yard is, is uh, Bermuda. So you can't plant tomatoes in Bermuda. So I rounded it up that two or three or four times and then I tilled it up, put compost in and some other things. And in two years, you can see the plants like it pretty well. Weeds. I. <laughs> if the soil's good, you're going to have a lot of weeds. So instead, of, by putting this fabric down, you don't have any weeds. And this fabric is not your normal landscape fabric that's real thick and heavy, and you got to, it's, I don't recommend that at all. What this is disposable. You could use it again, but I will, t when I do clean my beds this fall, I will throw that away and use it fresh next year. It's four foot wide. You can get it at, uh, I got this at Sam's, but you can get it at your hardwares and your nurseries probably have all have this. It's a perfect four foot feet wide. It's got staples that sticks and holds it, holds it to the ground and you don't have a single weed where it's at. Now, if you pull it back like I did for my onions, then <laughs> the weeds are gonna come. Okay, but that's, I don't know any way around that. You don't wanna plant onions in, in the little holes where, that you cut in this. I'll cut a little X, slip my tomatoes and peppers down there and that way there won't be a single weed in the whole thing. And next year when I plant my tomatoes and peppers, I won't have onions along the side, so there won't be any, any uh, uh, weeds at all. Also, I use leaves. A lot of times I'll pack so many leaves on there that the weeds don't have a chance. Okay, enough of that. Oh, and by the way, the fertilizer and the water goes right through this. It's, it's just like it's not there. It's not like that, those plastic things you buy. Tomato cages, I promised you I'd show you how to make my tomato cages. You can see that these are wonderful. It's, it, it's four foot wide, so it'd be nice to have the tomato cages two foot wide. You put two tomato cages, they fit in there perfectly. And you can get this wire just about anywhere you want to. Make sure the holes are big enough to get your hand in there to get the tomatoes out. Some of these, some of these are real small holes. Don't use them. You want to use these. You can get them short, tall, taller, whatever you float your boat. Okay, I already know because I've done these a bunch of times. It's 12 of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, there it is right there. All I've got to do, and you need a pretty good pair of pliers for this. I've done them with, without really good pliers, <laughs> and you got to be pretty daggum strong. I'm wearing gloves, and that's for a good reason. Three, 
two, one. Okay. And this will probably not cooperate because they know we're on TV. Okay, and if you notice how I did this, I did it wrong. <laughs> I, I wanted to have one of these and the next one would not have these on here. But uh, I got all excited and I've, I've cut it at the wrong end. But after you do about a, <laughs> two dozen of these suckers, you'll get it, you get it down pat. Anyhow, you use these to overlap your cage down through here. And you see how that goes. Perfect. This will last you the rest of your life. A tomato cage will last longer than you will. Okay. Very excited about that. And you want to use the gloves. And you think, well, when we have a windstorm, these, these things will blow over. Uh, they might when, they, when you first put them on there. But if you notice, these tomatoes have all intertwined. So this is one solid pack right here. This is all one solid thing, and it's not, it's not gonna blow over. I used to put plastic ties on here, and you can do that if, you're, if, you, if your tomatoes aren't very big. But if you just be patient till they got big enough, I don't let them wind out the fronts, like this one right here. I'll tuck it back in. You don't want anything out here because then it's hard to mow and hard to get around. You want them all to kind of blouse them up in here, but you don't need to do that down the center. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground. I've got some other stuff I'd like to show you, but we're out of time. I'm your host, Bud Quok. Until next time, master gardening, good gardening.